It is now time to heat things up a bit. We welcome you to the debate, curated by three crowns. The motion for the debate is rather provocative one. This house believes that specialized construction courts are better suited for resolving construction disputes as compared to arbitration. Before we begin, I would like all the delegates to chime in with their opinions through a poll we are conducting that will be notified on your screens. I now welcome our moderator for this debate, Ms. Penny Martin, counsel at Three, Crow Three Crowns. I request Ms. Penny Martin to take over the session now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Penny Martin and I'm counsel in the London office of Three Crowns. And we are very pleased to be presenting this debate to you today. It is my pleasure to in introduce our participants, starting with the members of our panel. Our Madam Chair for today's debate is Ms. Janine Parikh, who is the Head of Arbitration at Cyril Amalchand Mangaldas in Mumbai. With over 20 years of experience, Ms. Parikh focuses on arbitration and also handles commercial litigation relating to commercial contracts, shareholder issues, infrastructure, power and construction projects, financial and structured pr products, and white collar crime. She's also represented clients in various courts and tribunals across India, including the NCLT, High Courts and the Supreme Court of India. She is qualified to practice as an advocate and solicitor in India and as a solicitor in England and Wales. She is recognized as a global leader in arbitration in the Who's Who 2022 and has been ranked as a notable practitioner in dispute resolution by Asia Law and is recognized as one of the ALB top, India top disputes lawyers. In Legal 500, she is described as inspiring the complete trust of her clients. Ms. Preek is joined by Mr. Scott Vessel, who is a partner of Three Crowns located in our Bahrain office. He has a decade and a half of experience handling complex international investment and commercial arbitrations in the oil and gas, construction, energy, mining technology and agribusiness sectors. In addition to his private practice in international arbitration, he has served as an attorney advisor to the US Department of State and an international organisation. He is qualified as an attorney in New York and as a barrister in England and Wales. Who's Who Legal has re recognised him as a future league leader in international arbitration and clients have singled him out as one of the smartest lawyers I've ever worked with and praised his impressive pre-hearing preparation and his advocacy. He is also recommended in Legal 500 where he attracts praise for his ability to master complex issues. And finally on the panel, we have Simon Elliott, who's a partner of Three Crowns as well, located in our Paris office. He has provided advice and representation in numerous proceedings conducted under the rules of major institute, arbitration institutions and also ad hoc arbitrations with a particular focus on disputes arising out of large infrastructure and other major projects <clears throat> involving disputed technical delay and quantum related issues. He is qualified in New Zealand, England and Wales and in France. Simon is described in Legal 500 as a rising star and clients laud his impressive ability to deep dive into highly complex technical issues and turn them into elegant and powerful arguments. We are delighted to also have with us uh, two preeminent counsel who will be deba debating the motion today. We have Ms. Annalise Day QC and Mr. Nakul Diwan. Ms. Day is Queen's counsel and arbitrator at Fountain Court Chambers. She is ranked both as a leading silk <coughs> in six practice areas in the legal directories, commercial litigation, international arbitration, professional negligence, energy, construction, and insurance reinsurance, and also as an arbitrator. She has recently been described as an absolute rock star at the top of her game, who operates at the highest level in her areas of expertise, dealing with courts and tribunals as both lead counsel and arbitrator not only in the UK, but also in the Asia Pacific region, in the Middle East, and also in the Caribbean. In 2020, Ms. Day was named International uh, Arbitration Silk of the Year at the Chambers Bar Awards. She was previously been named Construction and Energy Silk of the Year by Chambers and Partners three times. Mr. Diwan is Senior Advocate and Barrister at 20 Essex and practices in Singapore, Delhi, and London. He acts as counsel in international arbitration and international litigation. 
and um, he specialises in disputes and international law advice relating to banking and finance, construction and engineering, corporate, which involves joint venture, uh, shareholder and partnership disputes, international commercial law, including media and telecommunications, mining, energy and natural resources. Uh, Mr. Diwan brings significant experience to complex trials, interim, interim applications, injunctions and appellate hearings, jurisdictional disputes and enforcement matters. He is described in Legal 500 as responsive and approachable and a quality act. And with that, it is my pleasure to pass the floor to the Madam Chair to introduce today's debate. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And good day, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of this topical debate without the responsibility of any of the arguments that go with it. Uh, the motion before the House today is this House believes that specialized construction courts are better suited for resolving construction disputes compared to arbitration. Now, before we proceed with the debate, we invite you to vote for or against the motion on the poll which is going to appear on the right side of your screen. So please go ahead. We will be asking you to vote again once the erudite arguments are over. Um, Penny, I'm not sure I can see uh, the poll. Okay. Yes, I think, I think we have the voting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, and uh, so before we start, I'd also invite you to submit any questions you have in the Q&A panel, and we will pick them up towards the end in the plenary session. Um, so, so let's start off, and I start first by looking at Annalise to open the case for the proposition. Well, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm particularly delighted that you've all, uh, the majority of you, have made the right decisions so far. 64% in favour of the motion, I think 36% against, and those 64% are absolutely correct specialized construction courts are better resolved and suited for resolving construction disputes. There are three reasons why, and I call this EEI, expertise, efficiency, and independence. And this house should see that the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, because one of the most senior construction um, judges and arbitrators in the world, Mr. Justice Ramsey is in the process of setting up a specialist construction court list in Singapore. He's dealt with arbitration, he's dealt with court, and he's decided that having this specialist list is the way forward. England has it, the DIFC has it, uh, and uh, so, so should India. It's an extremely efficient and effective way uh, to running and resolving these disputes. So let's just look at those different factors together. Expertise, judges who sit in construction lists know what they are doing. They are not party appointed or appointed by institutions. These are people who day in, day out, know the bread and butter of dealing with construction disputes. And I'm sure you've all had experience of people dipping into, for example, delay. We don't want people dealing with these claims who are not experienced, who don't know what delay experts can do and try and pull the wool over their eyes, who can marshal reams and reams of documentation and technical evidence, who can uh, effectively do witness conferencing, who are not led by counsel, but who are there to get to the bottom of and to resolve these disputes speedily and effectively. And speed is again, one of the main advantages of specialist construction lists. We've all seen how arbitrations can drag out, how the arbitrators are scared of doing anything because they may be accused of not following due process. Well, a judge in a specialist list has none of those disadvantages. 
they can act decisively and quickly. They have flexibility. They can encourage settlement if they feel that's appropriate. And in an industry where cash is king, that is so, so important. Next issue that the courts have an unrivaled um, advantage, and that's in relation to multi-party disputes. A court can compel different parties to be joined into proceedings. So you just have one set in complex projects. You don't want six different arbitrations with six different outcomes. You want the ability, if, if that's what seems appropriate, for all disputes to be resolved under one roof. Independence is so important in this field. We don't want people, the decisions to be based on whether you're likely to get appointed in the next dispute. We want these disputes to be resolved by people who are truly independent and who can give a view and direct these disputes so that they are resolved quickly and efficiently and correctly. When you're dealing with very, very complex technical evidence, you need people who know what they're doing. If I can deal then uh, with some of the things that may be said against me, the main one is confidentiality. But let's face it, confidentiality is completely overrated. Everybody knows uh, before GAR publishes it what's going on in big construction arbitrations. So uh, that isn't a reason to reject all these marvelous advantages that you have through having a specialist list. Uh, another advantage is appeals. It's sometimes said, well, this can slow the process down. But no, a, a good appeal system will mean that there's, the appeal is there to deal with a case where it's needed. Obviously, the vast majority of construction disputes will be fact-based. But if you need an appeal, you have the ability to have that revisited and also to build up a body of law uh, which can guide and assist uh, people. We all know the hunger of construction lawyers for law. When Walter Lilly was published, it went around the world. So we need these disputes to be resolved by skilled uh, professionals. And ladies and gentlemen, the only way that you can achieve that is through uh, the use of these specialist construction courts. They're here to stay. We should be embracing them and taking all the advantages that they offer as a new and effective way of getting these construction disputes resolved. Um, that's uh, all I had to say in opening, and I'll now pass over to uh, whoever's, well, I assume it's Nackle who will be uh, debating against the motion. Thank you, thank you, Annalise. Uh, I, I, I hope I can be seen and I hope I can be heard. And on the assumption that I can, I, I must confess, my first reaction when I saw this motion was, really? Are you serious about it? Because if you are, then you really need to read this motion very carefully. And let me just go back to what the motion is. And the motion is, this House believes that specialist, specialized construction courts are better suited for resolving construction disputes as compared to arbitration. And the first question that I ask myself is, where is this house? Is this house in London, New York, Singapore, the DIFC, or is this in India? And if you're not sitting in the Rolls building in London, where you perhaps are looking at the technology and the commercial courts, then I really think you need to relook at this proposition. Because if you're looking at being somewhere else, then I don't think you are in a position today where you can say that specialized construction courts are better suited for resolving construction disputes. And that's where I pick up the second part of this motion. This motion isn't about whether specialized construction courts are an, are an alternative to arbitration. The motion is whether they are better suited. And better suited means they're more suitable, they're more advantageous, they're more attractive. And I think everything that my learned friend has told you now is all about trying to convince and tell you that specialized construction courts are an alternative. They're not necessarily better suited. And let me give you four reasons why I think they're not better suited. 
Let me deal with the first part, domain specialists. Arbitration is where you can get domain specialists. You can choose the person that you want, and the person does not have to be a judge. The person could well be a civil engineer. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that I'm looking at a piping problem, right? I have a toilet where I have seepage coming through. Now, if I was before an arbitrator who would be a civil engineer, well, wouldn't it be significantly easier just trying to explain that problem to him rather than having an expert come in and do the same thing, especially when you have both parties who know exactly what the problem is? And let me just go ahead with giving you another example since I am on pipes. All of us who do construction disputes realize that there's something which relates to the cleaning of pipes. I'll take an example from an arbitration that I did. Okay, we're talking about a large petrochemical plant where certain pipes required to be cleaned with a chemical to make the pipe debris free. Now, making a pipe debris free is a complex process. And part of the evidence that had to be led, and it was extremely uh, important evidence, well, rela related to having to use something called a pipeline intervention gauge. Now, this arbitration went very well because you had domain specialists who completely appreciated what a pipeline intervention gauge was. But during the arbitration, nobody spoke about the pipeline intervention gauge as a pipeline intervention gauge. Everybody called it its abbreviated form. And the abbreviated form, ladies and gentlemen, is PIGS. Now, can you imagine if you're doing opening submissions before a court which doesn't have a specialized judge and you talk about pigs coming in to clean a pipeline, what do you think the judge is going to assume? Surely, I mean, aren't you going to be much better off with arbitration rather than have a judge come and tell you that getting, pips, uh, getting pigs to clean a pipeline is perhaps a violation of the prevention of cruelty statute in whichever nation you're doing this. Let me make another point to you. When you talk about flexibility, well, I actually tell you that Arbitration gives you significantly more flex flexibility. Let me break this up under two heads. The beauty about running an arbitration with experts is the ability of doing something called hot tubbing. Now, if I'm before a court, and whichever court I am before, I will necessarily have to follow the rules of court. And currently, rules of court do not permit uh, matter uh, aspects such as hot tubbing to getting for getting witnesses in and deciding and debating about their area of expertise. It's the traditional cross-examination that is followed. Why wouldn't I want to use, make use of technology such as hot tubbing? Certainly, these are things which have evolved for the more efficient way and more flexible way of running arbitrations. Let me give you another example. Every construction dispute, or at least primarily a lot of construction disputes, require disclosure of documents, and disclosure can be very significant. The reason why you have aspects such as the red fern schedule and the stern schedule is to ensure that you don't waste time uh, for the purposes of doing an oral hearing to get disclosure of documents. Well, if you went to the court and you could well go to the Singapore court for this, you would first end up before an assistant registrar. You would then end up before a high court judge. And if you could find a novel question of law when it came to disclosure of documents, you may well find yourself before the court of appeal. So forget about the appeal that my learned friend spoke to you about at the end of the matter. We're talking about an appeal at an interlocutory stage. And I now come back to a third point that I wish to make, and that's on confidentiality. Well, we all know that arbitration is confidential. When you have leaking pipes and dirty laundry to wash, you certainly don't want to do it in public because leaking pipes with dirty laundry is dirty water. Wouldn't you rather be in a confidential process? And let's not forget the last and I think the most significant point which we have to make here. You get through a dispute in court. I mean, you may get a specialized judge, but you still have to enforce that judgment. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to spend too much time debating this because all of us know that when it comes to enforcement, certainly arbitration awards are significantly more easier to enforce all around the world. And what's the point of running an entire dispute if you cannot see the pudding at the end of the day? The pudding is in an enforceable award. And until you have judgments of courts which are going to be as easily enforceable 
as arbitration awards, why would you even consider and suggest that special that specialized construction courts are better suited? I concede, maybe they are an alternative, but they are certainly not better suited. And that's the topic before you. And so therefore, for these reasons, I would say that it is time that the people who've polled need to change their mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Annalisa and uh, Knuckle. That was short, succinct, and to the point. Um, Annalise, can I ask you to close the case for the proposition? Yes, certainly. We are talking here not about general courts dealing with construction disputes, but specialized courts with specialist judges. And I say to you, India, that you should be leading the way in this. You should be world leaders. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be seen as the jurisdiction that is not looking at this and considering serving the construction industry with what it needs. And there is a good reason why these specialist courts are now springing up around the world. They can deal with, for example, adjudication, something we haven't talked about, but they have specialist procedures for ensuring that those awards are obtained and then enforced. I simply don't accept that it is easier to enforce a, an arbitration award uh, than, than a court award. There's no evidence of that. Um, secondly, uh, dealing with the point about uh, specialists, many of these specialist judges are dual qualified. So take Sir Vivian Ramsey, for example. He is not only an eminent lawyer, he's also an engineer. Again, all specialist courts have provision for uh, rules that deal with, um, for example, hot tubbing, or as it's called, concurrent evidence. But concurrent evidence, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't work unless the person resolving the dispute is able to effectively ask questions. I have seen Sir Vivian Ramsey settle a case by effectively hot tubbing two engineering experts with his dual hats on of engineer and lawyer. Incredibly effective. This is what we want. We don't want parties to be able to appoint their own experts and to mean, make the process dependent on who has the best lawyers and who has the best experts. We want the truth to come out. And the only way to do that is to have someone resolving your dispute who is a, a specialist. Um, time, let's talk about time. Again, I simply don't expect, accept that arbitration is quicker how many times have you seen hearings uh, adjourned for no good reason in arbitration? How many times have you waited a year plus for an award? How many times has that award been quite poorly reasoned and does not deal with the issues? It's mainly a recitation of the party submissions with perhaps a little section at the end in terms of the decision. Arbitration has become an unwieldy beast. It is not effective now in resolving disputes uh, quickly and efficiently. And certainly within India, one of the things that's become common is to appoint retired judges. How can that be right? We don't want that system to be replicated. And the system of arbitration in India uh, needs, needs a, a kick up the backside. <laughs> and this is the way to do it for construction disputes. My learned friend has absolutely no answer to what you do about multi-party disputes. It may be very, very unfair if you're the respondent in an arbitration that you cannot bring in the party truly responsible uh, for the problem. Why should you be faced with going through uh, different proceedings? Uh, instead, what should happen is that everybody should be in one set of uh, proceedings. And with respect, if my learned friend had seen how these specialists work around the world, they are incredibly flexible. They uh, can deal quickly and efficiently with um, disputes that arise. Not all disputes 
it's absolutely correct, require experts. Some are very focused on the contracts. Some are, are very focused on specific issues. Again, a specialist judge and a specialist list can pick out the issues that need to be determined. Very, very difficult to do uh, in arbitration. Again, with confidentiality, um, again, very, 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 very illusory. Confidentiality doesn't really exist. And indeed, within the confines of construction, how, how real is this spectre of confidentiality being needed? A big project on a multi-party dispute will actually sometimes be hindered by confidentiality because you may have five or six parties who need to know what's happening. You don't want, for example, the employer being able to pick off different people and not know what's happened with those disputes. And you need to have transparency in terms of all participants in a project. Again, these specialist courts are completely set up to, uh, to deal with this situation. And I, I think, as I say, that the proof is in the pudding. You haven't heard any criticism today, ladies and gentlemen, of the jurisdictions that run it effectively. The whole point is if you set it up in India, you would find or you would train up specialist judges who had technical expertise, who had experience. You would produce a set of appropriate rules to, uh, that could be tailored to construction disputes in particular. Again, you do not have um, that in Annalise, arbitration. Sorry, yeah. minute. Thank you. You do not have that in arbitration. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would urge you to pass this motion. This motion is not that the specialist lists are the only way for parties who really want to. Of course, they can still choose arbitration. Uh, but in my respectful submission, I would ask you to decide that this is a more efficient way. They're better suited to resolving these types of multi-party technical disputes which have technical issues but also complex legal issues and therefore I would ask you to pass this motion and set India on the track of becoming a world leader in this field rather than lagging behind. Thanks Annalise. Um, Nakul, can we ask you to make your closing for the opposition please? start with a concession and my concession is that yes when it comes to multi-party disputes any litigation offers you an advantage over arbitration but that's not the topic I think the one aspect that I heard my learned friend say not once but twice, perhaps three times, maybe even four. For somebody with, with whom I have, of whom I have a great amount of respect, somebody whom, before whom I have appeared as counsel, and his name is Vivian Ramsey. But unfortunately, Vivian Ramsey does not make up all of the world to be the reason why you we take the view that constr that specialized construction courts are better than arbitration. It can't be. And it comes back to the most fundamental question. Where is the house? And if you're looking at whether the house is in India, then I suspect that construction courts are certainly not going to be a better suited alternative to arbitration for a very simple reason. You would have to have a whole scale change of laws for you to be able to bring flexibility into a dispute resolution process for the purposes of running a construction dispute different from the way you run any other commercial dispute. And that requires a big change. Apart from the fact that you would have to find a different way of appointing specialists who would then be appointed as judges of the construction court. And again, I don't see that happening. 
So if that's not going to happen and we're going to look at the reality of the house, then the reality of the house is that where you have a procedure which allows you the flexibility of appointing the right person for the right job, then you should certainly go with that flexibility. And that flexibility comes in arbitration. Now let me come back to a second point. And the second point that my learned friend made was about confidentiality. And she said this when she opened a submission saying, well, do you know that God has brings out everything? Well, God brings out five stories a day. You have 500, if not 5,000 arbitrations in a day. So whatever is sent out to God is in de minimis proportion of the number of confidential proceedings that go on. Confidentiality is one of the keys to arbitrations and not wanting to wash dirty linen in public with leaking pipelines is certainly something which abodes well for arbitration and not for court. What about time? Well, you, you certainly have bad examples of arbitrations and arbitral awards being delivered a year after uh, uh, proceedings are closed. But who says that doesn't happen with construction, with, with any court? Courts delay judgments and they delay judgments all over the world only because of the pressures that judges are under. So again, in my view, it certainly doesn't become a better suited alternative. And I now come back to the first point which my learned friend made. We're not talking about general courts, we're talking about specialist courts. But I completely accept that we're talking about specialist courts. But let's remember one thing. Once you get appointed on a bench, well, then you're a judge. And for you to be in sync with what's happening in the industry is significantly harder as compared to you being outside, perhaps being absolutely in sync with the industry and then being appointed to a particular arbitration because you are the most specialist and the most uh, knowledgeable person in that particular area. Why would you want to lose that advantage? So for all of these reasons, and I don't think I need any more time because I don't think it's that complicated a process, I come back to, the, to how I began. Really? Do we really believe the specialized construction courts are better suited for resolving construction disputes as compared to arbitration? I'd say no. They are, and perhaps in the future can be an alternative, but they certainly cannot be better suited. I don't think I need to say too much more about enforcement because I think people who are listening to us know that it's significantly easier to enforce an arbitral award. So ladies and gentlemen, I would request you now to re-vote and take a view different from what you took when you they hadn't had the benefit of hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nakul. Um, Scott, uh, Simon, do you have any questions for our debaters? Yes, um, I had one question for each of the debaters. So first, my question to Ms. Day QC, and I'll, I'll pose both questions and then let them both respond. So the question to Ms. Day is, wouldn't a specialist list of institutionally appointed arbitrators with the authority to consolidate and join parties be the best of both worlds? And then my question to Mr. Dewan is, what about interim measures? Wouldn't you want a dispute about, say, performance bonds to be in front of the same court that is deciding your dispute? So, so dealing with the first point, um, it's simply not possible, as I understand it, in arbitration to force joinder on to parties because of the consensual nature of that process. So I've yet to see any institution that's been willing to say it has jurisdiction to join in people against their will to an arbitration. Um, so I don't think it's a real proposition. Secondly, in terms of the specialist institution, institutions are wonderful things, but they're not as effective a means of appointment as the state in this regard. And also in terms of independence, you only have true independence where you have someone who's appointed and whose future appointment is not in any way dependent on how they deal with 
a dispute. So I don't see those two as uh, advantages over. Indeed, I think there are still advantages to having the state appoint somebody who can then truly focus on what they should be doing, which is resolving the disputes. I also uh, think that courts can make stricter orders. Um, so in order to resolve some of these complex disputes, you do need somebody who's willing to perhaps take a view and say, let's focus on this or let's focus on that. Again, because of the issue of due process, uh, in, in my view, arbitrators are hamstrung in what they can do. It's much more going along with what the parties want. And sometimes for these complex disputes, that's not actually what's needed and is not the most efficient and effective way of resolving the dispute. But certainly, if anyone has any experience of joinder being possible in the arbitration context against the will of other parties, then I'd be interested to hear it. But I haven't yet seen that uh, operating effectively through any institution. OK, I'm, I'm going to take maybe 10 seconds or maybe 20 seconds to answer the question that you put to my learned friend. Uh, which was in relation to join uh, in, in, in to joinder, and let me tell you that India has a very involved jurisprudence in joining non-signatories uh, to arbitrations. Uh, and so, if you're looking at the house being in India, then uh, there there is there is a lot for you to read uh, in relation to how under Indian law for an Indian seated arbitration you can actually join a non-signatory into an arbitration. Uh, and, and 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 it has been done even if the parties are not related if it all arose out of one large dispute uh, coming to another uh, coming to the question that was put to me which was in relation to interim measures and performance bonds well here's my, my short answer is this you may go to a court for an emerge for, for for urgent interim relief but the court is going to grant you urgent interim relief only till the tribunal can look at it again so if there is an injunction on a performance bond, you will be back before the tribunal, perhaps as soon as it's constituted or a week after it's constituted, and the tribunal will hear the issue, issue, and it is going to be the same body which is going to decide the issue finally. And that would be the same thing if you went to an emergency arbitrator. I think Nakul has frozen. Um, Nakul, are you there or oh, you haven't frozen? No, I haven't frozen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Simon, any questions from you? Yes, I also have one question for each of the, the debaters. Um, my first question for Ms. Day QC relates to the, the idea that the ability to join third parties is a virtue of uh, court, specialized court proceedings. And my question to Ms. Day QC is, isn't that really uh, dependent upon who you are? You can well imagine that the owner who's contracted with an EPC contractor may prefer to resolve his or her dispute with the EPC contractor and avoid becoming ensnared in a long running dispute, which is effectively a battle between the EPC contractor and the parties with whom it's contracted. Um, to, to an extent, yes, but the point is that the judge and the specialist court can then consider that and decide whether it is appropriate for everything to be heard together. So joinder isn't automatic, but the point is that you have the ability to do that where that would be appropriate. But of course, the judge in that context can always say, no, I don't, I don't think that's right. Uh, and or, you know, judges can decide issues in a certain way. Um, they can hive, hive issues off much more easily and decide to deal with them. So again, even for an employer, there may be advantages uh, that come through the specialist list, which mean that the judge is able to deal with it in a more efficient way. I mean, look, overall, parties might all, not always like what judges do. But if, if they're a respected and experienced and independent, a judge with real credibility, my my uh, submission would be that it's still a more effective way of resolving construction disputes. So the motion is not really about what the parties prefer. The motion is based on what's the most effective way of resolving the dispute, which is why 
in my submission, this 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 motion should be overwhelmingly uh, carried because sometimes the most efficient way of resolving construction disputes is not following what the parties want. Thank you. And now my question for Mr. Dewan: What about the value to parties to construction disputes of uh, jurisprudence to help them guide their decisions? both when they're contracting and when they're taking decisions on at the project level. Aren't we losing something by having construction disputes resolved prim primarily through arbitration? W wouldn't that be the same if it came to just arbitration versus litigation, where jurisprudence in relation to the determination of disputes is just always party centric, uh, and none of these decisions really come out? Uh, so I don't know whether that would be a that would make a difference when it when you when you were only looking at construction disputes. But I accept I, I accept that yes. I mean, if you if you had decisions which would uh, which where contracts were interpreted by courts uh, and they were there for the world to see, uh, well, yes, it it would certainly iron out a lot of uh, issues in the future where parties would know exactly how courts interpret a particular provision in a contract. But I think I think that goes for all disputes. Thanks, thanks everyone. I I just have uh, one comment, or perhaps a, a comment mixed with a question. Um, I'm quite conscious that this debate is being done under the auspices of the Society of Construction Law, India. And I noted the rather clever twist that Nakul put on the proposition today, which is to distinguish really the motion as a generic statement and the fact that we are currently perhaps discussing or focusing to some extent on India. Now, under the Specific Relief Act, uh, special infrastructure and construction courts have, in fact, been set up. Um, and Lise, I, I won't ask you specifically on that. I can tell you that they are not fully functional right now. But the question, therefore, I have is for both of you, whether you would change your answer to this motion depending on whether this motion was purely India-centric or whether it was uh, for perhaps more developed global jurisdictions which don't have so many layers of courts and such massive backlogs. Um, e either of you, maybe Nakul, you can go first because I have made it India-centric. I, I, th I think there would be there, there would still be a couple of fundamental issues which wouldn't change whether you are in London, India, Singapore, or uh, whatever jurisdiction. Uh, those fundamental issues relate to enforcement uh, of, of a decree versus uh, enforcement of an award, confidentiality, and the ability of choosing what I would now call a super specialist. Uh, because a construction court, even in a developed uh, country which has got uh, construction courts, uh, and let's just take the roads building, will have specialists but may not have super specialists. So those advantages still would, would in my view, still board better for arbitration as opposed to going to a specialist construction court. As far as appeals are concerned, well, time timelines are are, are an issue, and I think timelines are a bigger issue in. Uh, countries which have a backlog of cases. Uh, and certainly, I mean, if you were in a country which where an appeal could be disposed of within six months of the appeal being filed, then yes, um, that has something that that certainly would uh, weigh in well for a construction court. But again, that would equally weigh in well for another court. Thanks. And Annalise, any comments? 
Well, I don't I don't think India should underrate itself. And um, one never moves forward unless one thinks of how you actually set it up and manage it. So the practicalities of it, I accept it might be more challenging within the Indian, con you know, the Indian court, the way it's constructed. But that doesn't mean you can't change things. And indeed, wouldn't it be an opportunity for the construction world to lead the way in terms of persuading uh, the powers that be, that actually you need a more efficient court. You might then see other courts in India uh, adopting it. And I think if India wants to remain a, a center for uh, dispute resolution, remember that these contracting parties will now have an option to choose, perhaps to go to a specialist court. So they could opt in, uh, as I understand it, there will be options to opt in to going to Singapore or going somewhere else. And therefore, my fear is that India will lose out unless it moves with the times, given that this is now a worldwide trend in terms of having these specialist construction courts. And I very much believe that there's lots and lots of talent in India, which would be more than capable of uh, fulfilling that space and become a, a leading uh, jurisdiction in the world for this. So I don't believe that one should just say, well, the situation is this, because then you will never change anything. And it's very, very important uh, in my submission to change and move with the times and keep the, uh, these disputes coming to India rather than going elsewhere. Thanks, Annalise. Um, Penny, do you want to take the audience questions now or after our deliberations? Thanks. I think we plan to um, perhaps hear the tribunal's decision um, and then have uh, the audience vote and then we might come back to the questions if, if that suits everybody. Okay, great. So should we, shall we log off uh, for a minute or two? And uh, perhaps uh, uh, will you run the poll right now, Penny? Yes, I think we can we can move to the poll now and, and if you um, wish to deliberate in, in parallel and then you can come back and render your decision and then we'll hear what the audience, how the audience compares. Okay, great.
Okay, everybody, we now have the um, the panel back with us who have deliberated and, and reached a view. Um, you have all also re reached a view. We, we have the results of, of the poll. Um, we have, I can announce we have 59% in favour of the motion and 41% against the motion. So that compares to our original poll, which I'm just going back to, if anybody else remembers the exact numbers there. Got yeah, yeah, I think it was 64 yeah. and 39 or something. I think exactly. Nakul has moved 5%. Yes. So yeah. we've had a slight shift in the mute, but um, the, line is, the line is held as far as the audience is concerned. Well, so so, so that was it, really it, close. Can, let us know the tribunal's decision. Um. Yes, so that was very close. And uh, the tribunal took some time to deliberate uh, after hearing very persuasive arguments on both sides. And uh, we did reach a decision. And that decision was that because we are the tribunal and we can make whatever decision we want, we have decided that it should be an opt-in and that while specialized construction courts in an ideal situation are nice to have, it should ultimately be left to the parties to decide whether they would prefer to proceed to a court or to arbitration. So bravo to both Annelise and Nakul. Thank you. Yes, thank uh, you. Well, well done to well done to Nackel for moving the dial. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But not enough. <laughs> Very good. We we also have um <clears throat> just a few questions um from from the floor which I might um announce and 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 see what what the responses are from the panel and and of course from our debaters. Uh, the first question was from Ellen. Uh, who asked the question, and this goes back to a, a topic we've discussed a couple of times in this debate, which is uh, a joinder of, of, of non-parties. And um, Alan has asked, um, how do you compel a non-party to the arbitration agreement to join the arbitration by subpoena? Or, and the question is, by subpoena through the courts? Um, Nakul, I think you, you mentioned um, a basis under Indian law, um, and perhaps you might be able to expand on that, and we could talk about that issue more generally. Yes. Uh, so, well, and, I mean, like I said, Indian law has evolved significantly uh, in this area. And uh, while you have what is called typically known as a group of companies doctrine that is used for the purposes of bringing in a non-signatory, you also now have a new doctrine, which is called the single integrated transaction doctrine. Uh, and it is typically used in shareholders agreements, but it has, in fact, been used in a non-shareholder scenario as well, uh, where four distinct entities were roped into an arbitration proceeding, even though two of them were not signat. I think I think two of them, or perhaps one of them, was not a signatory to that arbitration agreement, on the theory that it was a single integrated transaction and it made no sense to have multiple disputes. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Unless there's any more comments on that question, I can move to the, the next one. Um, there was a question from, or rather, a, I think, a comment from Praveen, um, who said that standing arbitral, arbitration tribunals instead of ad hoc or institutional arbitration would suit India. Parties would not have the right to appoint arbitrator. The international award will also be enforceable under the New York Convention also. Please uh, suggest the minister. Um, perhaps we could see what um, views are on, on this, perhaps what one might call it a hybrid, perhaps, of some of the features that we've discussed today. But I'll, I'll open it to the floor to see what the views are on this. Any comments? So, 
Sorry, Penny, I, I couldn't catch the question, perhaps because I... Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Michael. So, um, I mean, if, if you were looking for a comment from me, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear the question very clearly. Yeah, so the question was um, whether standing arbitration tribunals instead of ad hoc or institutional arbitration would suit India. Parties would not have the right to appoint an arbitrator. The international award would be enforceable under the New York Convention also. I mean, I'm not sure you can ever have one size fits all. Obviously, that sounds a bit like a DAB, which can be useful in certain circumstances to try and resolve disputes as they go along. But I think there is something to be said for having parties able to choose. Uh, the problem is you have to balance that with the tension that sometimes parties will never choose what's the best thing for resolving a dispute because ultimately parties are there to protect their interests. Um, which is why, personally, I, I genuinely believe it's quite useful to have a specialist court that can deal with those sorts of issues. I mean, I, I, I would I would agree. Uh, from the, I mean, now now that the debate is over, you can't have a one size fit fit all solution. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I think that brings us to time. Um, Shaleen, I don't know if you have any other, other remarks or whether I might just go ahead and close the session. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of you for attending in the audience. Um, we, we know you're there, we, we can't see you, but we, we know that you're all there and we thank you very much for joining us today. And I'd like, I'd like you to also thank our speakers, um, our panelists and also our excellent debaters who have given us much to think about today and have brought us a very lively discussion that I'm sure you've all enjoyed. Uh, we would also like to thank the, um, the organisers who have organised this conference very efficiently and we've been very pleased to be involved. We wish you all a lovely evening and thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Phew, what a, what a way to conclude our second day of this three-day international virtual conference. Tune in tomorrow for we have some really cool sessions lined up. We have exclusive session by our platinum sponsor, FTI Consulting, and gold sponsors, Mason, Madim, and Kroll. We have a fireside chat brought to you by Aiken Gum, Strauss, Hauer, and Hell, featuring Sir Rupert Jackson, interviewed by Mr. Hamish Lal. And lastly, we will have an address by our chief guest for the closing ceremony, Mr. Gary Weborn. For those of you who haven't yet explored the virtual forum, visit the engagement room for the quiz and the photo booth and meet the sponsors at the exhibition hall to know more about the services and products. You can participate in the quiz anytime from now till 2 p.m. tomorrow. We look forward to see you tomorrow.